Okay, well, anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, we have with us uh, Yuval Cherlov, uh, and also other folk. I've just seen Chaim Chesler come in, who's the grandfather of Limud FSU and all the former Soviet Union places. Um, he's trying to pretend. Oh, he's terrifying. <laughs> he is so terrifying. Um, and uh, Yuval Cherov, as you may have already seen in your program books, uh, is the head of the Yeshiva Amit Barat Shaul, um, uh, also Yeshiva Petach Tikva, um, and uh, perhaps more significantly for us and our point of attention is he is uh, one of the founding members of the Tsahar rabbinical organization. Uh, this is an organization which you'll explain more about in a moment, but just to tell you that um, just today, I think, uh, the news has come through that the Knesset has passed a bill, or is in the process, I think has passed the bill, I think, um, which Sahar has had a particular interest in uh, relating to uh, marriages in Israel. Uh, one element, I think, of the kinds of campaigns that Sahar has has led uh, or participated in, um, and he's he's published huge amounts of stuff on on a variety of uh, Judaic matters, both halakhic and ethical um, and philosophical, uh, and he's uh, participated in many Israeli government ethical committees. You'll all be pleased to know that Israeli government has them. We might like to recommend that to the British government that they might like to have an ethical committee or two. Um, so, uh, so we're really very, very pleased to have you well with us. Uh, he's going to do the majority of the talking, and I'm just going to occasionally interrupt and go, I've got bored now, can we try something else? <laughs> How's it going to go? Um, uh, but Yuval, perhaps you'll just start and explain a bit more about Zohar, what, what it is and how it came into being. Good evening. One of the consequences of Rabin's assassination was uh, all kinds of uh, movements and all kinds of groups in Israel that decided that things cannot continue as they were before the assassination. Not only because of the murder itself, because when you're talking about who killed Rabin, it was one person by his own. But when you're talking about all the environment that was before, and not less than that, all the problems that actually were, were raised up after the assassination, the hatred and the, <coughs> and the uh, conflict inside the society in Israel. So therefore there were a lot of movements and a lot of people that decided to make a change. One of them was a group of young rabbis, you know it was, I can say young rabbis, it was uh, years ago, <laughs> I can't say it anymore, <coughs> and um, that decided that we should uh, find and bridge above the gap that, we, that is becoming in the dis dispute, that is becoming more and more wider and more and more problematic between secular people, people and um, the rabbinical uh, of the Zionist, the, the, the rabbis of the Zionist religious movement. And we established it so how, in fact, our first, our vision was that we want that we will be the spokesman, that we will be part of, of um, uh, representing Yahadut in the state of Israel because in those days there were others that made it and they were bad. We didn't get the mandate from our colleagues. We had a convention, a small convention, a small meeting, and uh, the, we, didn't, we, didn't, we weren't qualified by, by our colleagues and our friends they said uh, we don't want anyone to represent us. We, the, the whole idea about representing rabbis, everyone one will speak for himself. So therefore we decided to f look, to search where is the more tangible, where is the main problem bet between secular people and Israel in a religious one, and rabbis, and we found it, it's the marriage. And that is because, to, uh, two reasons. First of all, according to the law in Israel in those days, and actually it still exists today, but it's in, in a process of change, every Jew that wants to get married officially in the state of Israel, but has been forced to do it by, uh, according to the Rabbanut. So therefore that by itself causes a lot of tension. 
The second thing is that rabbis didn't behave correctly from the ethical point of view. They had two weddings a night, they, took, uh, they were paid not according to the law, they didn't give receipts, and the whole atmosphere was against rabbis that they are, uh, uh, they are taking bribe and they are not honest and without any dignity. So, so, so therefore we pro decided to provide weddings by volunteers, by us, to secular uh, um, couples, and as well, we were sure there will be four a month or something like this, but that will be our small contribution. What happened was that immediately after we decided that, I think there was no television channel, no headline and no newspaper that didn't advertise us for free. I mean, we didn't invest even one penny of advertising. It was a real revolution. And today, Sohar has, I think, more than 30% of the marriages in Israel provides a Tsoha wedding. Tsoha wedding can be obvious for people that live here in UK, but in Israel it's not obvious that the rabbi will meet with the couple before the wedding and not only at the night of the wedding, that the rabbi will come on time, that he will uh, be you know, generous and, and modest. I mean, that he's not, it's not his show, it's the couple's wedding and it will not be paid and whatever. Since so then, can, can I just interrupt yeah. you for a moment, Yuval? You've said Sahar. How, how many are you? I mean, we, uh, I, do you know how many rabbis there are in Israel and yeah, how many you are? No, because a rabbi can be a, the driver of the Shas Knesset member is, is a rabbi. I mean, there's no uh, certificate, a certificate that says that you are a rabbi. But uh, let's say everyone that has been named as a rabbi, we're talking about 700, 800 uh, rabbis in all kinds of levels. I mean, all kinds of uh, teachers in yeshivot can be just, a rabbi. Just that number, 700, 800? Yeah. No, no, in Soha. Oh, in Soha, right. In Soha, okay, in, Soha. Right. in, Soha. in Israel, right. there are a lot of rabbis. Right. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but, but most of them are not being paid by the, I mean. Right, uh, they just happen to have yeah, a smicha from somebody. It's smicha, yeah. or they're teaching mm. in schools. Right. I mean, they're, I'm mm. not talking about rabbis that are corrupted or whatever. So therefore, uh, since then, Tsohar is doing a number of projects in Israel that are dealing with the Jewish identity and with Jewish people in Israel. We have a project in the Knesset. We give advice to Knesset members from all parties uh, trying to uh, promote Jewish identity of the state, not through religious laws. I'm not talking about Shabbos or about Chametz. I'm talking about uh, <clears throat> Uh, environmental issues, I'm talking about education. Uh, for instance, one of the laws that Sohar actually was the main engine to pass is that also grandparents will have rights towards their uh, grandchildren where, when there is a divorce and one of the sides are, uh, is, uh, is trying you know, to, to abandon or to, to, to disconnect between the grandchildren and the husband's parents or whatever. And all those kinds of things, ethical issues, uh, now we are uh, very, uh, working very hard on the law in Israel about uh, that someone that was uh, convicted and actually the trial was finished and he went to jail or whatever, he will not be able to be a minister for 14 years. And all those issues would made the decision that relig uh, Jewish, a Jewish state should be identified not only by Shabbos or by those issues, but uh, especially in um, other uh, fields that Judaism has what, what to say. That's one aspect and all kinds of other things. So can we step back for a minute, yeah. Yvonne, and just look at you, the man. Uh, so there you were, Yitzhak Rabin's assassination was a galvanized you and your colleagues. Uh, but five years before, or ten years before, you had become a rabbi, did you feel at that point that uh, already uncomfortable, something should change? Or, or, I mean, were you one of those activists or radicals or firebrands, or were you just one of the crowd and that moment pushed you out? I lived very far from the center of Israel. I lived in the Golan Heights, I think it's the, on the borders, you know, it's, it's the, the I can't say, the nearest town of Golan Heights is Tveria, you know, so you can imagine what I'm uh, speaking about. And I was, I'm con I was concentrating by teach in teaching in working with my uh, students and writing and here I didn't do anything for the entire society in Israel. 
and Rabin's assassination changed my mind. So when you read the newspapers, you weren't one of those people who got oh, it, something should... No, I was, was one of the, no I, was not, I was one of the demonstrators against Rabin, and I'm not apologizing now. Right. I demonstrated against right. him. I think he was wrong, uh, and I'm, I'm, I can't apologize. But the, the fact that what happened is, I'm saying again, it's not only the assassination, because the assassination mm. you can, uh, um, you know, distinguish between us and the assassination. It's not our fault. It's not, you know, all those mm. conversations mm. that I don't like. The, I think that no one, one can deny that the um, society was so torn uh, after the assassination, and we had to do something very, uh, very powerful in order to bridge the gap. So you are now, and you and, you and your colleagues, are uh, now trying to find a way in which the state of Israel should be Jewish in a richer, more ethical way than merely the imposition of rules. Um, how do you feel about the imposition of rules? So, so uh, do you feel that, um, I don't know, rules about not allowing transport on Shabbat or those kinds of things are, are a problem, should be abolished? Or are you comfortable with that, but you want more? It's, it's a very problematic issue, and, and I need five minutes to speak, at least five minutes, yep. because I think that in order to understand, uh, I, I'll, I'll start with one announcement. I didn't. One minute. I think this is turned off. Yeah. Okay. Um. No. Okay, now it's this No. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I didn't stu uh, study law, so therefore I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an uh, alternative, I mean, I'm not going now to uh, protect or defend uh, uh, the rabbis from executions. I want to explain, I think, most of the way of uh, rabbis in Israel feel. And rabbis in Israel feel that their main goal is to be uh, the continuation of the chain of uh, Moshe Kibel Torah Misenai and delivering the Torah from Sinai until the redemption, until the Mashiach will come. And their main commitment and their main goal is to continue to uh, um, deliver it and to transfer it, and transfer it from generation to generation without uh, allowing people to uh, change it. I'm not talking about changes, you know, tactical or small changes, but not the essence. So therefore, rabbis, that's one thing. And the second thing is that the state of Israel should apply as a state uh, the uh, identity and the Jewish identity of uh, our heritage and our continuation. So therefore, uh, I think that most of the rabbis in Israel see that these are the, their main two goals. The first one is the responsibility and the, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, trans, uh, to uh, transmit the Torah from generation to generation. And the second thing is that the state of Israel will be uh, designed and will apply the uh, Jewish identity of the state. Now, saying that doesn't mean that they are not uh, um, discussing the relationship between this issue and human rights and freedom of choice and freedom of religion and all those issues. I'm not talking about an extreme opinion that uh, someone declare, uh, declares that this is the only thing that, is bo that bothers, bothers him. But I'm talking about a very complicated issue that uh, trying to balance between all those values. So therefore, I can say that most of the rabbis don't see any problem that uh, besides the idea of human rights and freedom of choice, there's also the freedom of the majority to identify the society and to ident identify the state as a Jewish state. Let's do it with a few laws. Not now, even if we'll have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to say that everyone has to wear tzitzis or every woman has to la uh, chala, whatever, I think that most of so rabbis will be against it. But things, icons, that became part of, of uh, designing a Jewish state, like Shabbat, like marriage, like uh, kosher food in official uh, institute, I think that most of the rabbis support this idea. 
they don't want to expand it, but they will be against changing the status quo and trying to uh, limit it. But nevertheless, you feel that some of those things feel like impositions to people, and if they're not ethical or not morally delivered, they alienate people. Def definitely, definitely. Right. I, I'm talking about two things. First of all, the process. The process should be uh, with transparency, should be honest, should be I, all kinds of political tricks uh, and all kinds of uh, those kinds of, of uh, um, uh, trying, trying to, to, to solve th this dispute by making a fake of something or, or insulting or, or um, intimidating someone, etc. I think that most of the rabbis are against, I'm talking about the process. But it's not only the process. We, you must understand, one, I think everyone must understand that it is also a religious question. Is there really a value of someone that is observing mitzvahs because the coalition decided that uh, this will be accepted by the Knesset? Should his bracha will, should be, Baruch Ata Binyamin Netanyahu, the chairman of the Knesset, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav, Ichrichanu, uh, mitzvah Shabbat. Yeah, so they, they are, it's a, a very complicated issue, not only trying to balance between uh, those, the idea of the identity of the majority and the state with uh, human rights and freedom of choice and freedom of religion, it's also a religious question. What actually are the benefits uh, in principle, like I said before, and also tactical, because everyone understands, even the Haredim, even the ultra-Orthodox, that if you'll press too much, there'll be a boomerang effect when it will be possible, and actually Yair Lapid is, is demonstrating this, uh, this fact. Now, I didn't come here to speak about politics. I'm using those names only in order to explain things. I'm not criticizing, and I'm not involved in politics. It's uh, one of, I think that the separation between rabbis and politics should be very, very strict and um so it's separation that. between rabbis and politics yeah but you're not arguing for a separation between Church state, and state and religion no. No. no 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 definitely not i'm talking i think that we are trying to do something that is impossible trying to make a you know two sources of power democratic and Ju jewish democratic state but i think that we it's impossible to do something else so so, so given for example there's recently been an election for a new chief rabbi and there's an Ashkenazi and a Sephardi chief rabbi. Mm -hmm. There are chief rabbis in every town. We're all accustomed in the diaspora to receiving a tin of sardines for Pesach, which is Hechshed uh, Kosher mm -hmm. Pesach by somebody we never heard of. And we mm -hmm. thought, you know, so we don't know who any of these people are. Um, this structure of the, of the rabbinate in Israel, uh, is, there, is that itself flawed or is it the way that the people have utilized it? Would you like to change the structure if you could? Uh, I'm more bothered than the, about the essence than about the structure. And that's a, it's a problem. I mean, you know, there are two things that you should, uh, that there is a connection between them, but uh, everyone is uh, dealing with something else. There is a problem with the structure and the fact that uh, the chief rabbis are being elected by a very min small group that actually it's old politics and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And this is the problem of the structure, and um, I'm disappointed. But I, I don't have a good uh, suggestion. That that's the truth. I don't have something better to to suggest. There are all kinds of uh, ideas like communal uh, a ra a rabbinate and without a, a state rabbinical. But then we will lose our main benefit from uh, 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 the, the idea of the state rabbinate, and that is the power to enforce divorcing when uh, someone is, is evil. Divorce. Divorce, right. yeah. And that's, you don't have here in the, in the diaspora, and we have it because there's the, this is the main benefit uh, out, of the, out of the structure. What I'm dealing with- Can you with, just explain that a little bit yeah. more? So, when, so this is around the territory of Aguna yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and so forth. Yeah. So just spell that out a little bit more, because not everybody is, will understand. The, the, the idea is that because it's uh, a institute of the state, actually, the, all the uh, system of police, of jails, of enforcing, of, of uh, trying to apply uh, psakdin uh, decisions of the rabbinot 
is being done by the state, and the state has power. So you're actually able to put a man into prison who refuses to give his yeah, wife a gun. I, I didn't say it's been done enough. I said I'm talking about the structure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not talking about about the essence. I have a lot what to say, but the structure. This is the main benefit. I mean, uh, in practice, in practice, but there are, are more. Uh, other ideas by the fact that the state, Jewish state, has a chief rabbinate. It's also a kind of a declaration, and, the, and it gives the rabbinate a lot of opportunities, exactly like the institute of the president. The president in Israel actually uh, doesn't have, I don't think that he has two things only by law, and, but it's an institute that can do a lot according to the character and who is the president and his decisions. Uh, the, the same thing is with the chief rabbinate. It's also there is a lot of uh, uh, importance, uh, importance here about the declaration. And uh, if there are good chief rabbis, and I think that the current rabbis are starting in the right leg with the right leg. I think they're starting very nicely, and I think they they may do it. Uh, they they can uh, take the advantage and the opportunity of new chief rabbis, and the, and to, they're okay. The issues that uh, I'm bothered more is actually, okay, so we have the structure, we have, let's say, some power, we have the opportunities, what are we going to do with it? How to engage with the secular movement? What is our opinions about the strangers? I mean, about the Palestinians and about the um, uh, refugees and about uh, all, all, all those uh, issues. What is actually the, uh, how will, sh should we uh, balance the fact that uh, rabbis will not interrupt in, uh, politi in politics, uh, intervene in politics uh, uh, processes, uh, and all those issues. What should the chief rabbi do? That's uh, more in Shemitah, for instance. It's, it's our goal only uh, to, you know, to have two, uh, pails in, in our kitchen that will separate between this kind of fruit or this kind of fruit. And all. I'm not going to explain all this. Uh, all, all this <laughs> so Shemitah is this business of the seventh year, the seventh and, year and not yeah. using the local Or changes. to, uh, again, take the advantage and make a social justice revolution uh, and the connection between Yahadut. There will be a session here with, uh, I saw Enat is here and from Teva Ivri and whatever. So. All those things are much more interesting. So one of the interesting things that I've picked up from the rabbinate uh, in different places, for example, um, particularly from within the conservative movement in America, uh, there's been a big pressure to uh, hechsha kosher food only if it's ethically kosher, not just technically kosher. There's been a certain resistance on the part of some of the orthodox rabbinate. To go, we don't need to make this more complicated. It's already complicated. Right, to add in extra things which got nothing to do with kashrut is missing the point. Um, so are you, are you uh, supporting such a move that kashrut ought to carry ethics with it as well as um, uh, ritual uh, correctness? Or would you say this is something more voluntary which we ought to promote and encourage but not impose? I'm a, I really uh, usually support uh, small steps. And uh, I think 10 years ago, I was one of the people that established the uh, Maglei um, Tzedek, uh, that actually gave a kosher certificate to uh, uh, businesses that are keeping this kind of kosher. I mean, they pay on time to their employees, they, uh, they, they, the, uh, they are accessible for, for disabled, and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. They pay tax and whatever we had. And it's very interesting. The first time they wanted to call it to that kashrut, and we the, so it's a that, certificate. Yeah, so a kosher certificate. No, it's a kosher social certificate. Yeah, to that kashrut chevratit. And then they came with a question, and the question was, will we give this certificate to a non-kosher uh, restaurant or store or whatever uh, that are selling uh, pa 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 uh, all kinds? and whatever and I said yes I said yes but change the name don't, let's not call it to that kashrut chavratit let's call it, let's call it a social label to tav taken chavratit whatever and uh, and they decided to do that so then, it became known as the magin 
What did you call it before? Tav teken chavot. Before they turn to that kashrut chavot, they don't call it, you can't call it a place that is selling non-kosher food, a kosher, okay? But then they came with the question, will there be also businesses that are open on Shabbos that will accept, will be, will have this certificate? And this, I debate it, because Shabbos is not only a ben adam lamakom, it's not only a religious, uh, issue between us and the divine, it's also giving rest to your employees. And if a place is open in Sh on Shabbat, people will work seven days a week. And you can't say that there'll be a kind of a, a kosher certificate, social certificate to a place that actually people work there against one of the messages of Shabbat that we have in the Torah. So I'm giving this example because I think this is the way to change things. I'm not a big revolutionary. I don't believe in revolutions, and I usually think that revolutions, the price that you pay when you get the response or retaliation, then it's, it's the price that will, will be too high. And, uh, and the shock and the overshocking of those changes. I'm a big supporter of evolution, and this is the first step. I don't know where we'll be the, eventually, where will we get to? I will be very satisfied if we'll find a way to combine this social kosher food and uh, and kosher food, I mean, according to, to Shulchan Aruch about uh, uh, kosher uh, halachas. But uh, let's go slowly. I mean, let's start, let's, because one of the things you see that those processes actually raises new questions. Mm -hmm. For instance, can a kosher, can a open, so a restaurant on Shabbos can be um, considered as a place that where they apply social justice. I mean, something is, and those new questions are really inspiring because we have to discuss them. We have to, to uh, like, like every new halacha that is actually we're writing it in those days. Good. Um, I, I've often thought that the quickest way to get more people to care about Shabbat in Israel is to introduce a two-day weekend. Um, it, and, and I've always felt that if the rabbinate had fought for another day off, they'd get more people keeping the, Shabbat. Uh, there's a big, uh, the, 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 there's a big di discussion because you spoke this morning about Sheshit Yamin Ta'avod mm. as uh, also a kind of a message of the Torah. The Torah doesn't say only over Yom Shvi Tishbot. Six days you should work. Six days, you, six should days work. you should work. I mean, and work is not only necessity according to our tradition. It's not employed work. It's, it's, it's more than that. Mm. It's, you know, it's exploring and, 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 and improving and doing things and, and this is the image of, uh, the icon of, of Hashem, the, the, the image of God, so uh, that we have. So it's also, it's a good question about religion against the, the idea that maybe more people will observe Shabbat, it will, be, it will be two days of vacation. But from the other hand, it's something that is against the, the, the ethos about uh, working the yeah, idea actually, you have to be employed but, for six You know, but, but, but in Israel they say, you know what, let's start with three days, okay? <laughs> and then, then we'll come for, uh, to, to work uh, five days a week. <laughs> That's what we go there. We'll open up for questions in just a minute, but just one last question from me, Yvonne. Um, in terms of uh, trying to change attitudes, uh, many of us, I mean, we're here at Limud, many of us would say this is about an educational exercise. Getting into schools, getting to students, getting... Uh, getting into yeshivot at the, the preliminary stages. Uh, has Tzohar tried to make impact or done anything in that direction? Um, I'm not sure it's not the part of the bad news. And the situation in Israel, and I'm, I don't know if it's abroad the same thing, but it seems like it's the same, that the percentage of the more, let's say, ultra-Orthodox, even inside of the uh, Zionist religious movement that are educators um, is much higher than the moderate uh, teachers and rabbis. And there's, there are two reasons. First of all, I admire them. I admire them, I, I can't say them because it's also me, but I admire this group because they decided to uh, dedicate their life and dedicate their efforts and go to do the most important thing and to be educators, okay? So that's one thing and you can, you should salute this group. The second reason is because they really don't have an, an option. 
by principle, they are against secular studies. They will not go to universities or to high-level universities. So actually, the only way they can make their living is education. So combining those two reasons in Israel, at least in our society, in the Zionist religious society, the, the, I'm saying again, the percentage of educators that are considered as more right-wing, I mean UK terms, not, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about settlements, uh, are, uh, considered right-wings are, are, is much, much bigger than the real portion in the, in the society. And that can cause two things that are very problematic. One is that more and more of the future students will be more right wings from the religious point of view and ignoring and even against all kinds of democratic ideas and the, the bad news. The, but this is, the, okay, the worst uh, uh, scenario can be that they'll kick. I mean, they'll respond and they'll say, we don't want this way of living. And then they'll go you know, to the other side and they'll become more secular because the teacher were too extreme and, and, and they were under pressure. And it's a big, big uh, discussion today in Israel. For instance, uh, um, the, 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 I don't know if the word is inspector or whatever of, of uh, learning Tanakh in Israel. She's a very, very good person. She's, she's bright, she's, she knows Tanakh and she's a great educator. But when she was appointed, there was a battle against her because she was too open. She read Tanakh according to the, what the Tanakh says, and, that, and not according to what we want the Tanakh to say. <laughs> and there was a big, a lot of pressure from those educators that she will not be appointed. Um, uh, and this is only one example. Right. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's very difficult to say what will be with the next generation. Probably there's also, you know, we have to remember that uh, the, our, the, the um, uh, importance of educators, or at least their power, is reducing from day to day because of the internet, because of the mobile phone, because of all other things that the students are exposed to that who knows what we as parents or as educators, as rabbis, what is our you know, part in designing the next generation Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. At least we have to do our best. Thank you. So, uh, questions, yes. Just tell us who you are or where you're from uh, before uh, asking your questions. I'm now lecturer at the University of Reading for Israel. Uh, I want to press a little bit on, on the point of public transportation and actually uh, in Shabbat and actually link it to the point about social justice. Because, I mean, the state of Israel wanted to be a religious state that, that sort of, because this is important for the Jewish um, character prohibits transportation on Shabbat, it would have been consistent but very uh, very aggressive, right? But it doesn't do that. It allows trans transportation on Shabbat for anyone who has the means to own a car. And so the implication of that is that currently there is a social injustice in the fact that people who cannot own a car are effectively trapped at home, assuming they want to go, right? They want to go um, to see their grandfather in the hospital, they want to go to the beach, they want they want to, uh, um, to just explore the city, or they're only their oppressed. And so the question is, why isn't that uh, a concern as well? I mean, a concern with regards to, to people who clearly um, <coughs> want to, to have their Shabbat in a different way than people who are. It is. And, 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 and so ju just to add another question, <coughs> and I entirely agree with you that people should not be employed seven days a week, but, but, um, but there are other, social democratic states, say, in Western Europe, where public transportation would run seven days, but people would not be employed seven days. They'll have a day off or two days off in different times. So I'm not sure that's a binary. Um, just, be, just before you respond on that, I, I, I mean, this is a, a dilemma on all sorts of fronts. And many, many years ago in Limud, um, and I hope we never try and repeat the experiment. But many years in, uh, ago in Limud, we had the dates all were wrong, and Christmas was being inconvenient for the Jews. Uh, <laughs> and so as a result, we had to run Limud that year from a Wednesday to a Wednesday. We had Shabbat in the middle of the program. And so whereas usually people come to Shabbat here at Limud if they really want Shabbat, on that time, they came, they didn't necessarily choose Shabbat, it was just in the middle. And we had 1,500 people and we had to feed them and we had to, it was all terribly complicated. 
And it was worse because we had people in hotels all around the town and, and stuff. And we ran shuttle buses to get people into the hut, but not on Shabbat. And a liberal Jew, very dedicated, religious liberal Jew, um, said to me, uh, to my mind, Shabbat is about people getting together and being able to join their community and, 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 and coming in with the group. And because you don't run the shuttle bus on Shabbat, you're breaking Shabbat in my view. You're making it harder for people to keep Shabbat and, and so on. So I mean, this kind of issue, these two values, the, the values of the halakha on the one hand and the uh, broader uh, ideals on the other, do sometimes find themselves in conflict. And, and so this is evident in Israel, as you say, people with cars can drive around, people without can't. Now, how do you respond to that? First of all, I, I agree. I agree that, uh, and my allies are people that will uh, agree that it's a good question. And it, it's a factor that you, have, you should calculate. I mean, you should consider the fact that it's unfair that if you want, uh, there's no public uh, transportation, that who pays the price? Who cannot go to the, to the beach on, on, in the summer or visit their parents? First of all, I do agree that it's a factor. But it's too easy <coughs> to, uh, to say that the only answer and the only solution is uh, public transportation. It's too easy. Because this is one of the solutions, and the price that we are going to pay is about the, as I said, uh, uh, the, the, the law and the identity of the state is actually not forcing people to observe Shabbat. They can't, the, the law cannot do it, and the, it's not only that they cannot do it, I said, it, the, the, uh, can't do it, I said before that I'm not sure that it has any religious or any value. If uh, because of the Knesset, people will not uh, go on Shabbat. We're talking about an image of the state. We're talking about the the the, the structure of, of of the icon of the state as a Jewish state. So therefore, I do believe, and we have one one uh, experiment that try to do that. That you can solve this problem or find a way where people will be able to move from place to place. The state will not force people to observe Shabbat because, as I said, it's unacceptable. But from the other hand, the main public transportation, I mean buses and trains, for instance, will uh, not work on Shabbat. So these are uh, solutions that I prefer because even though they're not, and I'll speak about it when I'll speak about ethics, in ethics, you can make two kinds of uh, decisions, two, two structures of decision. From the philosophic uh, point of view, the best thing to, do, to say if there's a dilemma or debate, say yes or no. Because then you'll have a co coherent uh, decision and everything will be, you know, logic. If you're trying to find a solution, a compromise or something, so from, in, from the beginning you know that you will not succeed to do something coherent. Current. You can't do that. Because if you decide that only if someone has four children, then he can do, uh, uh, let's say, a, a PGD, I mean pre-implementation genetic diagnosis, so why four or not three or not five or, or whatever? And you will not succeed to do that. But nevertheless, most of the ethical decisions is trying to find a kind of compromise because it's the, the benefit is are that is it's, it's a win-win game. And not only uh, emphasizing or uh, deciding that this is the only factor that you should consider. So my answer is the following. One, I think that your question is a right, is something that I can, uh, you know, it, it, it's part of my, uh, um, it's not a conflict between, between us, it's a dilemma uh, that we have to find uh, the way to, to calculate and to consider this uh, factor. Second, that I think that the decision to decide, or you know, social justice, or Jewish uh, identity, uh, Jewish identity from in, in this aspect will be a wrong structure of decision, and there are all kinds of experiments and all kinds of of planning that to to, to find the best solution, a kind of a compromise that uh, will will uh, consider those uh, those uh, two factors. And it's just worth mentioning, by the way, that the former chief rabbi, but one, Lord Jakubowicz, uh, spoke in Parliament against the relaxation of the Sunday trading laws, um, saying that uh, as, a, as a rabbi and as a Jew, he felt it was important for society 
to get a common day off. So, I mean, it's an interesting articulation uh, manifest here in Britain. Um, Chaim, next. Louder, please, so people can hear also. To make two small comments, which I think are substantial. Two to my own uh, family story, which reflect the Israeli society. But you know, there's a big trend speech about educate, educated Israelis. They don't want to get married. They don't want to have anything to do with the rabbinical establishment. And knowing what happened now with the chief, former, former chief rabbi of taking bribes and taking all kind of ugly matters that reflect the Israeli domain. <coughs> So it happened to my family. My daughter said, I don't want to get married. If this is the kind of rabbi, I don't want to get married. She's an architect, uh, uh, her, her uh, boyfriend at the time is uh, an, an Israeli pilot. So they are a cream of the Israeli society, which many, many of them. There's no way we want to get married. I said, no way, the, my daughter will not get married in a proper manner. <coughs> so we make a compromise, which I bet on you. I didn't know you, I mean, uh, at all. I'm not looking at you personally. I said, look, we have to look for a rabbi from Atzohar. You know what? You kill me afterwards. If it, you want war, kill me. So, anyway, eventually... You're alive. <laughs> I said, you know what? We tried it. We made a private, uh, we made a private wedding in Tivon. The rabbi was from Givat Shmuel. On Friday, he drove all the way to Tivon, on the eve of Shabbat. It was so great, you couldn't even believe. And my, my child and uh, my uh, son-in-law, we were very pleased, and all the guests were very pleased. And that should show the contribution of Atoa <coughs> to the Israeli public. It's substantial, it's not a minor one. On one hand. On the other hand, on another thing which confused me, Atoa, it looks like a liberal, modern, orthodox uh, uh, trend. But in the Atoa itself, there's no one, uh, one thing. Because the Rabbi Yuval Sharlo, which you uh, viewed <coughs> are known, on the other hand, it's like the leader of uh, Rabbi Atzor is Rabbi Ariel, which is extreme, extreme view on many very uh, delicate issues. And I, sometimes I say, what is Rabbi Ariel and Rabbi Sharlo have to do in the same camp? So actually, what I'm saying is that even Atzor doesn't speak in one voice. Okay, I, I must admit that if the rabbis would have spoken in one voice, I would lose my job. <laughs> I mean, as a teacher, as a, in the yeshiva, the wo first word that I'm teaching my students is machloket. You know, machloket, mm. disagreement is, is part of, of law, is, is, is an essential issue in Yahadut, and there is a machloket. But if every machloket will uh, bring us to separate and to distinguish between and, and to, to, to break the, 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 the group, uh, I think that. Uh, we have a lot of experience that uh, the destruction is is part of it. So there is there is a lot of you are right, Jaime. There are a lot of conversations, disagreements, and okay, this is uh, this this is life. I mean, when I was a baby teacher back way back in the middle of the last century, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, it may surprise you to know that I was one of those kind of trendy, down there with the kids teachers. Um, and, and my kids would often say to me, you know, why can't all the teachers be like you? And I would say, don't say that. Because if you want uniformity amongst teachers, they won't all be like me. I will be forced to be like them. <laughs> right? So desiring a standard is sometimes very constraining to the diversity that exists. And in order to accommodate or create or allow uh, some of those rabbis that might be very palatable to people at one end, then you have to allow the possibility of those rabbis at the other end. Uh, and that may be frustrating for those of us who like to know where things stand, but it seems to me actually very important that we, um, and it's a very important limit principle, that we let as much uh, unity be established without uniformity because uniformity is actually death. We need argument. I, I agree with you there. Let's, uh, yes, over here. Uh, um, I wanna, before I ask a few difficult questions, <coughs> raise briefly a few difficult issues. Can people hear? No. Could you speak up, please? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tanya, I'm from Be'er Sheva. Um, I uh, want to raise a few difficult issues. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So before that, I want to say that I deeply respect you and I think you're definitely one of the Unfortunately, few, but definitely one of the leaders, um, few, rabbinic few. leaders in Israel, and ethical and moral voices that I, uh, I always appreciate listening to, even if we don't always agree. Um, now, my question. No, we'll, we'll disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe 
Now she's a yeah, bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in principle, I do agree with you, <laughs> but you are fabulous. Yeah. But. No, well, uh, uh, <laughs> let me write it down. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and, and this is something that I that I feel very deeply about as someone who's been involved for many years in the issue of Adunot and uh, and women who can't receive a guest. I think that presenting Zohar as the uh, organization which um, creates marriage in a nicer, more with more integrity and in a nicer way is certainly true. And many couples in Israel have. Um, gained a lot from that, but if Chas V'Shalom Chaim's daughter, who got married with a lovely rabbi from Soa, ever needs a divorce, Soa will not have helped her at all. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about the various solutions that do exist within al and what um, you personally or the organization is doing about it. So we've got 10 minutes left in the session, and I, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do for the last five minutes, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, so solve those problems and we'll get on to the next issues. Okay, <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, okay. It, it's really we will be not uh, serious enough to, to answer uh, them in 10 minutes, in 5 minutes, in 20, in <laughs> two generations. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll, I'll say the following. First of all, most uh, three out of four uh, of your questions are uh, debating that I'm debating. I mean, I don't have a answer that I know what is the right answer and I definitely don't you know never say never I I think that the only thing that I can be sure that things will not look the same in 20 years I mean even less but I don't know what will be the direction there, there, there are all kinds of factors so I don't have the answer to all the questions the only question that I I, I don't have any problems is the 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 uh, obsessively about uh, 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 dealing with Tzniut, I do agree, but I'm not sure that we are in the same position. I don't know your opinions. I do think that uh, things, you know, it, 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 we are bothering with it, is, with it too much, and we, it's one of the problems that we, that avoids, and actually we're so concentrated on this issue that there's, you know, wide range of issues in in our halachic behavior and in our faith and praying with whatever that we are not dealing because of, of this and this, probably we'll find uh, we can be partners in, in, in this issue. And the other three questions, I, I, I don't have a, a answer. I, I know, I think that I know what should be the process. I think I'm, I'm going first of all to the fourth question. I, uh, I, you said that Saha will not be at all part of um, the solution, if chas v'shalom, there'll be problems. It's not correctly. So is working, is trying. And I'm not talking about you know here in UK or this in the United States. Prenup agreements are of obvious in Israel. It's not obvious, and so is promoting this. There's all kinds of issues that so are trying that trying to be to change the dayanim, the judges, and we are working at on it. But this is not. We have to solve this problem. And again, I don't know exactly how, but I know that. And, and I'm dedicating a lot of efforts to find the solution that no one will be able to utilize the halacha in order to abuse his wife or the opposite. I mean, halacha is not a, an, an instrument and someone can use it and be evil. That's, that's definitely, it's not only because of humanity towards the woman or towards the husband sometimes, it's also from my religious uh, perspective. I mean, 
I cannot stand the idea that someone is using the halacha in order to do evil and not to, 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 to do the right thing. So halacha should be the solution, not the problem. From the, that's one thing. From now, uh, uh, about the uh, non-orthodox movement in, in, um, in Israel, I must be honest, I'll say my opinion, okay, but, uh, but after three minutes I'm escaping. Okay, so I, I'll, I'll say the, the following. I don't know if you know, I wrote and I was criticized by all my colleagues that they think that there is importance of the non-orthodox nominations in uh, all over the world. And um, I know it from my family, most of my family are non-affiliated or affiliated and they are, we are losing them. I mean, all my cousins are interfaith marriage and, and whatever. I, I know it very well and I think that the non-orthodox movements are very important abroad. I think that in Israel, the necessity of them is very low. Because in the United States or in all over Europe, if you are not connected to a congregation, whatever, I mean, you are, you are, you know, you are melting. In Israel, by definition, once you're part of the state, you speak Hebrew, all, all the, 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 the idea of uh, that the, your cycle is, is actually Jewish, the calendar, the, 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 the necessity of non-Orthodox uh, movements is much lower. This is the reason they don't have a great success in Israel. And this is the reason I'm not so enthusiastic of uh, having them in Israel. I'm honest, I said my truth, I don't, I'm not hiding behind my words. About ordinated uh, women as rabbis, I still, I, I, I must admit, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm part of, I was one of the founders of the first Midrash of Ena Natsiv in Israel. I mean, I do think that, as I said before. So what, what does that do? Ena Natsiv is a girl studying Torah. Today it's obvious, but uh, it was 30 years ago. Wow, I'm old. <laughs> it was, uh, it was in 1982. Wow. Okay, so, 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 so uh, 30 years ago, I was one of the established, uh, I didn't establish, I was one of the founders that uh, uh, started in an Atsiv and I'm teaching in Migdal Oz. I'm, I'm, I don't know, things are in a promotion. There's a lot, of, many problems. It's not, only, uh, it's not only by principle, it's also many other uh, uh, issues that I don't know how to solve yet. But I do think that women should be more and more part of and integrated into the halachic discussion or whatever. I want only to emphasize that Bet Hillel, it's not correct exactly what you said. They are not a rabbi's organization. They call themselves leadership. As, as leadership, it's also in very, very right wing. For instance, the Takana Forum that uh, is dealing with uh, sex abuse in the uh, Zionist religious movement, the rabbis like Rav Lichtim and Rav Ariel are there, but the head is uh, Yudit Shilat, she's not a rabbi, and she's a female, and she's the head of the forum. And it's, what's more impressive, it's not only for rabbis. I mean, it's psychologists and, and lawyers and, and psychiatrists and whatever, all kinds of fields are working together, think and th are changing. It may be very too slow, we don't know exactly what will be the final destination. I don't know what eventually will be the point that we'll reach, but things are changing, and I think it's a good thing that they are changing. Folks, time for one more, I think. Um, we'll take uh, this. Yeah, you. My name is Jason Holtz. I'm a member of the Central Conference of American Rabbis and the Assembly of Reform Rabbis here in the United Kingdom. And I appreciate what you said about Israel not necessarily needing the non-Orthodox movements, but my question is, why does that need the force of law, and why can't that be left up to the people to decide? Because I think a number of Israelis are increasingly numbers um, joining the Reform and Conservative synagogues in Israel, and the movements are growing there, not shrinking. And increasingly, they're going to Reform rabbis, and they're going to Conservative rabbis, for support and Israelis are voting with their feet for reform and conservative and alternative kinds of synagogues. And if you go to Kol Shema in Jerusalem or you go to Beit Daniel and tell Jason, them, hold it there. We've got the point. Why, why does it need to be a legal structure that okay. keeps non-Orthodox movements? I'll, I'll uh, say two announcements. If you're right in your facts, so this is what will be in Israel. I mean, if people will vote in their feet, Israel is a democratic state, and eventually this is what will happen. I must admit that uh, it's not my, 
I, I'm not so um, sure that, that this is the, the right description of what's happening in Israel with the reform and the conservative movements, but if you're right, that this will happen. But saying that it's not a, a, a factor or it's not the, the business of the state, that's incorrect in Israel. I mean, part of the discussion in Israel is the identity of the state. This is part of the discussion of the society. It's not like saying like in, in all over the world where the, it's not the, the, the state is not considered as a Jewish state and then everyone will do whatever he wants. It's legal and it's democratic and it's for me acceptable that there'll be a disagreement or dispute in Israel what should be the identity that the state will adopt the state will, will adopt. And I can't understand the criticism against the idea that we are using the state as a, a ground field that the discussion of those issues and, the, and designing the, the identity of the state. This is part of, of I'm, not the pol, I'm not talking about politics, speaking about power. I'm talking about the, that this is the place that Israel is discussing what is the identity of the state and what should Judaism look like in the state. And I think at least, it's, it's, it's not only legal, it's, it's part of, of our life to try to design what society do we want to live in it, what should be the icon of it, and as I said before, that what will symbolize the adult, I don't see any problem with this idea. Now, if you're right, as I said, that uh, the numbers are increasing, so they'll be part of the discussion and they will. Folks, we've run out of time. Um, I, I think... You see, Yuval, I didn't even have to ask them. They were just, <laughs> they were just pleased it was over. Yeah. Um, I, I think really, you know, Tanya said that you were one of the important voices in Israel, and that's clearly the case. And uh, there are clearly hot issues that you're right in the heart of, some of which I guess people will have agreed with and disagreed with. Earlier on, I mean, we did this more or less blind. We didn't uh, rehearse. I'm sure that wasn't obvious. Um, <laughs> but uh, we didn't rehearse. But earlier on when we met, uh, I asked you, well, you know, how it was going and so on. And he said, well, this is great because I can go and listen to people whose opinions I don't normally hear. Um, so a man who really clearly does want to grapple with this stuff uh, and whether his current places, where our current places are, whether his future places where he is now, uh, all of those things will unfold. But it's really been lovely to listen to you and to meet you. And you have many subsequent sessions, so if people want to hear more about his thinking, uh, check the program book and see where that is. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Yuval, so much. Okay.